he goes over there to the piano and start banging all kinds of crazy sounds out. Then yells at Latoya and's like, sing, sing, but sing. We're going to be bigger and better than your bitch ass brother has ever been. January 1970, the Beatles asked Phil to come to London to help them produce their Let It Be work. And I sure didn't mind that the job would take him out of the country. We needed a break from each other. It was a good time for Phil too. He really got along with the Beatles, especially George and John. They liked what he did with the Let It Be album so much that they asked him to produce their first solo records. One project led to the next, and Phil ended up staying in London for the next year. Glory! Glory! Working with the Beatles at Apple Records really seemed to bring Phil's confidence back. He seemed excited about his work for the first time since he shut down his label. It was just before Thanksgiving when Phil brought home George's My Sweet Lord. He played it through for me on the piano so I could get the melody. Then he had me sing it. Wow, he said. That's the way it should sound. Then he'd play it again and again. I must have sung that song 25 times. Every time I finished, Phil would smile and say, once more, then I do it again. Working on songs that way can be hard work, but I didn't mind. Phil hadn't rehearsed me like this since before we were married and I was thrilled. I knew that there was more to it than that. Phil wasn't warming me up by the piano every night for nothing. But if he was planning to record me, he wasn't in a hurry to tell me about it. Phil was teasing me to the point of torture, and he knew it. I could have killed him. He didn't mention another word about it before he went back to London. But three days later, I got a call at 6.15 in the morning. I knew who it was before I even picked up. Do you think you can get your mother to fly out here with you after the first of the year, he asked? To London? Yeah, Phil answered. Somebody got to take care of Dante while you're in the studio. Think you can work it out? What? I screamed, I'll be there. When my mother I and I flew to London with Dante in March 1971, I still had no idea what songs Phil was going to have me record. The day after I arrived, Phil took me to EMI Abbey Road Studios to start rehearsing for my record. Pete Bennett met us there, and that was when I found out I'd be recording under the name Ronnie Spector. Remember, Phil Spector is in London helping the individual Beatles with their projects, okay? Girl, he just asked Ronnie to come down with the baby and her mother, okay? Because the mother has to watch Ronnie while Ronnie is in the studio working with Phil. She also going to be working with George Harrison. I guess George decided to take a doll or something. And he wrote some songs, girl, something about fried chicken. She started singing the fried chicken song. And she was like, wait a minute, this don't sound right. This is, this is a song about eating a big chicken or fried chicken or baked chicken or something like that, girl. By the time she got to the second verse, she was like, oh, no, this ain't right. Something ain't right. They, meaning Phil and George, are like, oh, yeah, good job, good job. Ronnie's like, I don't know. After we finished, I sat on a folding chair and listened to the playback with George and Phil. I was hoping for a miracle, but when I heard my voice fighting that droning melody all the way through the song, I knew my first impression was right. The record stunk. George just sat there with his elbows on a piano and his head resting in his hands. I don't think he moved a muscle during the entire playback. Phil, on the other hand, couldn't stop moving. He paced back and forth in the studio with his head cocked up towards the speakers. When the song ended, no one said a word. I knew I had to say something and that it had to be diplomatic. Guys, I said, I'm still not sure that's my kind of song. Neither of them said anything, so I tried again. What if we redid it? 
I said, maybe I could put a little more vibrato in there. Forget the vibrato, Phil said, rolling his eyes. Vibrato is 60s, he said. Nobody wants to hear that anymore. This is 1971. The flip side was an even weirder song called Tandaroo Chicken. My big comeback on Apple Records turned out to be nothing but a joke. There was no way radio guys were going to play music by me talking about frying chicken. You know how you can return to a place and feel like you never left? That's how it was for me in the mansion. On my first day back, I was sitting in my bed working on a paint by numbers picture of the blue boy. When Phil walked in, let's go downstairs, Veronica, he announced. I'm going to run a movie. It was barely 11 in the morning and he expected me to go down and sit with him for two hours in a dark room watching a movie. What movie, Phil? I don't even know why I even bothered to ask. I already knew the answer already. Citizen Kane. So the movie Citizen Kane was kind of like a obsession with Phil. Even Veronica was feeling uncomfortable. Veronica, that would be the Ronnie, was feeling uncomfortable with how obsessed he was about that movie. Now, I ain't never seen the movie. Maybe I should watch it. Is it good enough for me to watch y'all? Reading this part reminds me of when he was with LaToya Jackson. If you guys did not go through the journey, the LaToya Jackson book with us, let me remind you. LaToya Jackson had went to Phil Spector's house thinking that he was going to uh, rejuvenate her career because even though he is a nut job, he is still a very capable producer. He hadn't been in a while, but LaToya's career wasn't sparkling so maybe we can make magic together she went over to that man house the house looked like the adams family house and the man who answered the door looked like lurch she's sitting in the room by herself it's dust and cobwebs all over the damn place so gecko specter just appeared in the room where latoya was on the couch next to her hi latoya have you ever seen the movie Psycho? She's like, no, I never seen Psycho. You should see it. Latoya, do you want to go to the Bates Motel with me? Uh, no, I thought we were here to do music, Phil. Oh, yes, let's go do music. He goes over there to the piano and start banging all kinds of crazy sounds out. Then yells at Latoya and is like, sing! Sing, bitch, sing. We're going to be bigger and better than your bitch-ass brother has ever been. The toy's like, what the hell? He got a problem with my brother? Fuck your brother. Fuck him, LaToya. Just like and that. And then she's like, oh, I'm sitting in the house with the crazy man. Maybe I should get the F out of here. Oh, uh, Phil, do you mind if I go home right quick? I need to get something to eat. Or I need to go visit some friends. Some craziness. But she was trying to get away from him. She said she ran so quick and so far from that house that she never looked back. Then Phil called Joe Jackson and said, I know you got LaToya. I know you hiding her from me. I'm getting ready to come get her with the blicker. And I'm about to throw them things at your ass. Joe Jackson ain't no sucker. So he was like, well, come on then. Veronica says to him, no, I don't want to watch Citizen Kane with you. He froze dead in his tracks. No, he said, spinning around. No what? No movie. I couldn't believe I was talking like this. I felt like a ventriloquist dummy whose words were coming from somewhere else. No, I don't want to see Citizen Kane. Not now, not ever again. Why? He gasped. Why not? Because I hate it, Phil. Okay, I hate Citizen Kane. You hate it? Poor Phil. He actually seemed hurt. He continued talking, but he looked dazed. How could anyone hate Citizen Kane? His confusion didn't last long. It was only a few seconds before his lips curled into a snarl and his eyes started glowing with a wild animal look that most people only see in monster movies. I don't like what's come over you, he said. I know you've been drinking, but I have news for you, little girl. I won't take this kind of shiz. Not in my house, not for my wife. 
then maybe you should let your wife out of the house every once in a while. You can leave here when you learn how to act like a responsible grown-up, Phil shouted. And at the rate you're going, that might never happen. Then he slammed the door to our bedroom and tried to lock it from the outside. I didn't care. I felt great. Phil was still trying to get the door bolted when I realized that there was another way out. How could he have forgotten that the bathroom opened out into another bedroom? It didn't matter. I ran through that bedroom and out to the hallway where Phil was still fumbling around with the keys. He almost jumped when he saw me, but I was halfway down the stairs by then. He ran to the top of the staircase and shouted after me, Go ahead! Try to leave! See how far you get! A couple of downstairs maids peeked out from behind doorways to see what all the yelling was about, but nobody tried to stop me. I had no idea where I was going, but I knew I had to get the hell out of there. I was still wearing my slippers when I left the house, but I kicked them off as soon as I got outside the front gate. So she walking barefoot, lost and turned out. And this old lady sitting in like her condominium complex next to the pool has said, come here child, why you around here with no shoes on, looking all disheveled? Come in here, let me fix you a pot of coffee. Child, she ain't fixed Ronnie a pot of coffee, she fixed Ronnie a joint. And said, now I don't know what's going on in your life, but you need to get yourself together. She said the lady had no idea who she was. We were still sitting there a few minutes later. We were still sitting there. When a few minutes later, a couple of gay guys who lived in her building dropped in to say hello. Child, we finna go see the boss. Diana Ross. I mean, here I was, one of the Ronettes, sitting right here in front of them. But I was just a nobody. I felt like saying, hey, don't give me that supreme shiz. I was a Ronette. And we had a little something going on too, you know. But I didn't say it because I wasn't a Ronette anymore. It was past 7 o'clock that night when I made it back home. I'd gotten pretty drunk at Phyllis's house, so she offered to take me back up the hill in her car. I still hadn't told her anything about myself, so she was shocked when she saw where I lived. Are you sure this is your house, honey? She said. I just laughed, said goodbye, and stumbled into the kitchen through the servant's door. I heard Phil playing pool downstairs when I walked in, so I tiptoed up the back stairs to our bedroom. Thank God I found Alcoholics Anonymous. The time I spent at AA meetings gave me the only sanity I had in the last year of my marriage. Actually, my going there was Phil's idea. Why don't you try AA? I didn't argue. I was all for anything that got me out of the house for a couple of hours every day. That's all AA was at first. A perfect excuse to get away from Phil's yelling and screaming. When things got too hot at home, I just say, I don't have time for this, Phil. I've got a meeting. And then I'd walk out, and he couldn't say no to that. But the more I went to those meetings, the more I learned about my problem. I found out that I'm what's called a periodic alcoholic. That means that, that I drink during periods of high stress, which was pretty much all the time at my house. This all happened in early 1972, which was about the same time I first realized that Phil had been hiding a drinking problem himself. Ain't this a bag of beans? I went to AA meetings almost every day during the spring of 1972. I left Phil for good on June 12th, 1972. I feel like such